Welcome everyone. How are y'all doing? Yes. Getting in the Christmas spirit? Yes. Preparing for company? Travel? Celebration with friends? All that busyness? We're all preparing for that? And sometimes when we get busy, sometimes it can cloud maybe our heart and our mind because we're focused on all the little details that need to get done. Today we're going to look at John the Harbinger and the message that he brought to the planet so that love could take hold. And maybe there's a message in there for us today that could help us prepare the way for love. Okay? In the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ, it says, Now Zacharias was a priest, and in his turn led the temple service in Jerusalem. It came to pass, as Zacharias stood before the Lord and burned incense in the holy place, that Gabriel came and stood before his face. Gabriel said, O man of God, fear not. I bring to you and all the world a message of goodwill and peace on earth. Behold, the Prince of Peace, the King you seek, will quickly come. Your wife will bear you a son, a holy son, of whom the prophet wrote. Behold, I send Elijah unto you again before the coming of the Lord, and he will level down the hills, fill the valleys up, and pave the way for him who shall redeem. From the beginning of the age, your son has been born the name of John and the mercy of the Lord. He will be honored in the sight of God, and he will drink no wine, and from his birth he will be filled with holy breath. And Gabriel stood before Elizabeth as she was in silence in her home and told her all the words that he said to Zacharias. And then when Zacharias got home, they rejoiced. This is the prequel to Christmas. So five months have passed by, and now Gabriel now goes to Mary and to announce that she will have a son, Emmanuel. And Mary went with haste to tell Elizabeth about the promises of Gabriel, and together they rejoiced. And Mary stayed three months with Elizabeth. So can you imagine the energy that would be around the two women supporting each other, both pregnant, had this message from an angel, from God, that their sons have this great mission. And they stayed together for three months. Feel that nurturing and that excitement that they were supporting each other. And don't you know that Jesus and John were probably communicating? <laughs> don't you think? Don't you think? Shortly after John was born, then Zacharias looked upon the infant son and said, You will be called the prophet of the Holy One, and you will be, go before his face and prepare his way. And you will give a knowledge of salvation unto Israel, and you will preach the gospel of repentance and blotting out of sins. Behold, the day star from on high will visit us to light the way for those who sit in darkness of the shadow land and guide our feet unto the ways of peace. Can you feel Zacharias' excitement as he's telling the mission of his son that he was told. <clears throat> then in chapter 3, Jesus is born, and Elizabeth and Zacharias go and visit Mary. And um, they recount all the wondrous things that God has told them. And we know that part of the story, right? Jesus is born. Then the three wise men come, and they had run into Herod. And Herod heard of this prophet and this new king that were um, going to be born, and he was really not happy about that because that would threaten his existence, so he thought. So the three wise men told Mary and Joseph, you better skedaddle, <laughs> and um, head leave so that keep the baby safe. So Mary and Jesus and Joseph went to Egypt and 
um, make a long story short, Elizabeth and John end up in Egypt as well. <coughs> so the guards, they're looking to, of course, kill the babies. And so the guards go to Zacharias and say, where is John? And he says, I don't know. And so they come back three times, and finally they kill him because he won't tell them. So now we have um, the guards go back and tell Herod that I think we've got them. Okay, no need to worry. Now in chapter 6 and 7, Mary and Elizabeth are in Egypt, and they're being taught by the masters, Elihu and Salome. And they were telling them that these chosen mothers have the long promised sons and they're going to teach these children what these children are going to teach the world and they said they will be the first to teach that the kingdom of God is within they will be the first to preach the gospel of goodwill to men and peace on earth and we call these sun revealers of the light, but they must have the light before they can reveal the light. So they are to teach them that God and man were one, but through carnal thoughts and words and deeds, man tore himself away from God and debased himself. That holy breath would make them one again, restoring harmony and peace. And only love unites God and man. So he clothed his son in flesh so man can comprehend love. The only savior of the world is love, and Jesus, son of Mary, comes to manifest that love to them. And Cindy talked about that last week. That love is the strongest energy. And when we're creating in love, there's no need to be saved from anything. We are in that space of love, and it's transforming all that we're doing. Now, love cannot be manifest until it has been prepared and not can render the rocks and bring down the lofty hills and fill the valleys up and thus prepare the way but purity. But purity in life men do not comprehend, so it too must come in the flesh. And Elizabeth, you are blessed because your son is purity made flesh and he shall pave the way for love. Now they were taught many things. They were there for three years. But let's talk about what does it mean when they said he will bring down the hills and fill up the valleys? Does that sound pretty powerful? Do you think it could also sound th a little threatening that he has this power to, um, to wield? It's not like he's going to be moving earth. He doesn't have heavy yellow equipment and be paving, <laughs> bringing down the mountains and filling up the valleys. It's not the little or literal earth moving. When we're on our path, if there is a hill or a mountain in front of us, there is an energetic obstacle. It's in ourself. It could be a thought pattern, a belief, or a judgment that's blocking our way to move into love. So, it takes a long time because we either have to keep going around the mountain or try and go up over the mountain. Mm -hmm. And when we're in the valley, doesn't the mountain look even bigger? Mm -hmm. We're in that valley of despair or lower energy as we're trying to get on that path to move to righteousness, to love with our own higher self. So we can get stuck in that lower consciousness. So John is here to help clear the thoughts of man and return them to the true state of who they are. Right? Make sense? Okay. He's trying to lift them up to create everybody on the same page. No, this is how you move. This is how we're going to prepare so that love can be your guide. So purity, when we hear that word purity, do we f cringe? Do we have a problem feeling that it's a little too lofty for us? Purity, what does that really mean? 
It doesn't mean that we're void of experience or thoughts or desires or our desire to create. It's the returning of our true individual nature where our intentions are pure, where they're aligned with our higher self, where our actions are aligned with our thoughts, and they're love-based and they hurt or harm no man. We still have our unique desires and our experiences of our uniqueness, but they just need to be in alignment. Sometimes when we bring up traditional things, there's certain words that create an energy that kind of ping us a little bit. And when we talk metaphysically, we're trying to help discharge that energy so that we can move and really see the truth of what's being said. So have you ever tried to change your heart or open your heart or feel love without changing your mind? It's kind of difficult, isn't it? Don't we have a lot of thoughts that keep rolling around and we know maybe those aren't right thoughts, but we just don't know how to shift and change. And we keep bunning up against our mountains and looking up from our valleys and maybe just feeling overwhelmed and giving up. So John represents our intellect. It's the ruling of our mind that he's trying to that he will be trying to shift and change so that we can make way to receive that greater love. Uh, they are continuing to be taught for three years. They're telling them all these wonderful things and then how hard it's going to be for them. And they say, but don't worry, most people aren't going to get it yet, but it's not going to be lost because it's all going to be written down and... It will be remembered. <clears throat> so then they go on their way. And Elizabeth and John end up with a teacher, uh, Matheno, who's an Israelite priest. He's a priest of Egypt. And he ends up teaching John all the Jewish rites and festivals. And he, John could not understand how sin could be forgiving be forgiven by sacrificing animals. And Matheno says, the God in heaven and earth does not require sacrifice. The custom with its cruel rites are bor borrowed from idol worshipers of other lands. No sin was ever blotted out by a sacrifice or bird or animal or man. Sin is the rushing forth of men into the fens of wickedness. If one would get away from sin, he must retrace his steps and find his way out of the fens of wickedness. Well, I didn't know what a fen was. So a fen is a dirty, murky, mucky, swampy. Okay. So metaphysically, sin is when we go against our higher nature. Everything is cause and effect. We put something out, it comes back to us. If we don't like it, we change and recreate. When we sin... It's like we know we shouldn't do that. We've been guided not to do that, but I think I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> Have we all done that? Yeah. Or even maybe we're guided to do something and we are a little afraid to step out there and follow that guidance. <clears throat> so when we are rushing, <laughs> rushing forth into the fens of wickedness. It's, we're in that carnal nature. We get in that carnal nature and our emotions get attached and it bogs us down, clouds our vision, and then we act. And so now he's saying, now we go back and retrace your steps. Pull yourself out of that energy and now recreate. Change and recreate. Put a new thought. Return and purify your hearts by love and righteousness, and you shall be forgiven. This is the burden of the message that the harbinger shall bring. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is the paying up of debts. A man who wrongs another man can never be forgiven until he writes the wrong. None can be right, none can right the wrong but him who does the wrong. 
So John, in his wee little consciousness, says, If that be true, where is the power to forgive except the power that rests in man himself? Can man forgive himself? So Matheno says, The door is wide ajar. You see the way of man's return to right and forgiveness of sins. So what he's saying is that God does not forgive because God does not judge. When we hold judgment, then we're the ones that need to forgive. And when we are perhaps judging or upset, doesn't that occur in a moment? Something happens and we make a judgment about somebody, something, and it's a moment. But that moment of judgment creates a stain vibration in your body for a lifetime unless it is forgiven and released. Breathe. Your mission here is that of the harbinger. A harbinger is one who brings information, who paves the way. You will go before the Messiah's face to pave the way and make the people ready to receive their king. This readiness is purity of heart. None but the pure in heart can recognize the king. This purification is the process to integrate with our higher self. And what we focus on expands. If we are not focused on love, we can't see love. We may be right now out Christmas shopping and standing in line, and we might not be able to see the love of the people in front of us because our mind is clouded with all the things that we need to do or what might not be right. We might be looking at their faults instead of seeing the love that might be right in front of us. Men need a pattern to follow, Athena says. Men comprehend the inner life by what they see and do. They come to God through ceremonies and forms. And so when you make men know that sins are washed away by purity in life, a symbolic rite may be introduced. In water, wash the bodies of the people who would turn away and strive for purity of life. And you shall say, men of Israel, reform and wash Become the sons of purity, and you shall be forgiven. So this is a symbolic act. Now, instead of sacrificing, now they can sim symbolically, I'm going to wash and wash away those thoughts and beliefs and turn back to God. It's an outer demonstration of an inner working. And so it, for them, it was helping to allow the teachings of love to be held within them because they have to clear their current level of consciousness so that that higher vibration of love can take hold. Reform and wash. And we don't require baptism because we know that that love of God is within us and it can be a beautiful demonstration um, if someone desires to publicly display that, turning their, their hearts and minds and soul back to God and align with their higher self. Now, all this is being taught to John, and he studies for 18 years. And then he goes out in his mission, and we've all heard um, growing up, repent, reform, prepare to meet your king. So repent just means to change. It's another one of those words that maybe when you grew up, you said repent meant that you have to feel bad and ashamed and, and have that negative energy around it. But that just creates more thoughts that lead to that. It really just means change what you're doing, change your thoughts, change your actions, and return to God, return to love. So repent, change, prepare to meet your king. It needs to change so that you can see love, recognize love, take love in and hold love. So as John goes out and tells everybody to repent and tells them what they're doing wrong and gets on to them, it's really upsetting some of the rulers. 
Um, so he's causing a ruckus, just like Jesus did, and they don't like it. So they um, get upset with him, and they're asking him who he is. He said, I am the voice of one who cries in the wilderness. Prepare the way, make straight the paths, for lo, the Prince of Peace will come to rule in love. Turning to the multitudes, he said, Christ is the King of Righteousness, Christ is love of God, Christ lives in every heart of purity. And then John baptizes Jesus. Then shortly after he does that, John is arrested, and he's put in a dungeon. And Jesus goes on his mission and picks the 12 disciples. While later, John ends up being beheaded, symbolizing our letting go of our intellect, our thought, to allow a new way of living. We're going to let go of all those rules and reasoning mind, and now we're letting Christ guide. Now it's Christ's mission, and that love is guiding instead of our head is guiding. Does that make sense? So how to prepare for love? Repent, change. Forgive sins. Forgive just means return, return to your higher nature. Lift. Creates a straight path from the heart to the head. So change, forgive. Change, forgive, lift. We're changing our thoughts. We're forgiving, we're letting that move, and then we're lifting. The heart can come up and now guide us. And what a wonderful gift this Christmas season. Forgive. Forgive. It's free. <laughs> What's it going to cost you? A change of thought, a change of heart. Is So if we're looking at John's message, change forgive and lift. We're changing our thoughts and preparing to receive that love energy, the Christ energy that is all around us, especially heightened at this season, the love of each other. Is there anything that we could reform, repent, or change in our perception yes. that would allow greater love this Christmas season? Even if we're just talking about right now. Is there anybody we could forgive this Christmas season? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that we need to forgive in ourselves? Are there any thoughts that could be purified to allow our heart that straight path to our mind? And let our heart speak. Everybody breathe. Let's go within. Just take a nice deep breath. And God, I ask that a column of your love and light unfold this group. And just imagine an individual column of light come over you where you sit, holding you safe. And in this space, think about what thought could be your mountain. What thought is keeping your heart from expressing? Is there anybody or anything that you can forgive? from that one moment in time to allow a healing in your own heart and theirs for the flow of love to be reestablished for greater health. And just imagine whatever it is just lifting it up and just imagining that it's being washed away as you consciously say, I release this and I forgive. Like it's just 
this purity of love and light just move through you. Dissolving it. Healing it. Removing all those blocks in that mental mind. And if you can, allow your heart to feel that inflowing light. Feel your heart flowing up, moving out. Moving up, creating that straight pathway into your mind, in your head, in your consciousness. And I now let my heart be my guide. I prepare for greater love, to express greater love, to hold greater love that the Christ brought, that is me. And just allow that light just to grow brighter moving the texture of anything that you are holding, moving it out of your field. Feeling cleansed, changed, forgiven. Just take a nice deep breath. Feel how you feel. And when you're ready, just gently open your eyes. As we go through this holiday season, maybe when we start to feel that we're in our head and not feeling that Christmas spirit, we can think, change, forgive, lift. Change, forgive, lift. And like John, we don't have to lose our head. <laughs> we only need to let our heart guide. Take a deep breath. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.